Good morning, everyone. And a good morning to anyone who is watching with us online. And um, I, hope, I hope you all have a great week. This morning, to start with, I'm going to read a call to worship in Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. To the ends of all the earth have, been, have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with the trumpets and blast of the ram's horn, shout for joy before the Lord the King. Let the scene resound and everything in it, the world and who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people with equity. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our King, our Savior, and our friend. You never left us nor forsaken us. You are always with us and keeping us safe. On this morning you have made, as we gather together to worship you and praise you, with the songs that we sing, may your name be glorified. I pray that you will renew our hearts and every day, and may we become more like you, Jesus. You are our strong foundation, and may we continue to keep you at the center of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This morning, I invite you to stand, to sing, and praise God. Enter his gates with this giving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say, This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with this giving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day. has made me glad he has made me glad he has made me glad i will rejoice for he has made me glad he has made me glad he has made me glad i will rejoice for he has made me glad he has made me glad he has made I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you, all I have within me, I give. 
Broken 
Morning, church. It's our time to commune and converse with our Lord. And there are so many things to discuss with our Lord that we can be here actually for a couple of hours. But before I tell you a number of things that I think we should be praying about as a church or we have been asked to pray for, is there anything that you want to tell the wider body of Christ that you would like your brothers and sisters to be praying for you during the week? or something you want them to give thanks on your behalf, or something you just want to praise God for uh, in front of your brothers and sisters. Is there anyone? Okay, Gord. Okay. Gord. Okay, so Gord was informing us that uh, we should pray for Brenda and Christy, uh, his wife and daughter, as they are having some tests uh, coming up, and continue to hold Ed uh, Gibrant in prayer. And they also have a relative uh, that has some health issues. And then also uh, Sharon, uh, we are found out, as Gord is saying, that she now has a date for her hip surgery. So that's been put off so many times. So this is great news that she has that a settled date for her hip surgery. Okay, uh, Wendy, you wanted to... Okay. So Wendy is uh, letting us know that uh, her one sister, Joanne, which we have heard of and been praying for, uh, is still dealing with her cancer. But also her other sister, another sister, Debbie, is dealing with cancer. And of course, as you know, Ed, her husband, is dealing with cancer. So there is a family that has uh, cancer uh, overload, if you can say that. Um, so we need to be praying for the Gibrants and their family as well. Oh, pardon? And, yes. Yes, and so Wendy's just saying, praise God that he's in her life uh, because through these kinds of situations, he is our great hope and our strength. And uh, no matter what happens, uh, he is the one who holds our life in our hands and he has hope and life for us, those who believe in him. Say, say. Is your exam near the end of September or the beginning? Oh, okay, so very quick, okay. 
So Sese uh, is just praising God for the opportunity and the completion of uh, a lot of her study that she started in January and she's finished her practicum, which was a very busy summer, wasn't it, for you? Yes, so that is just finished, and but she has one more step to get through an exam on September 1st. So uh, let's continue to pray uh, for her and give thanks. Uh, Ali. I pray for all the friends and family and everything So Ali's asking for prayer for all the people affected by the continuing fires in BC. And she asked for a most practical thing that we should ask for, heavy, good rain for them. Yes. Anyone else? Well, in addition to that, I wanted to just let you know of a few things. Uh, as I said, we can be here for a couple hours, would not, which, not, would, which would not be a bad thing. Maybe someday we should do that on a Sunday morning. We'll just devote our Sunday worship, change it up to a time of prayer for an hour and a half. And uh, I'll keep that in the back of my head about that. Uh, here's a number of things that are going on amongst ourselves. These are initiatives that are coming up or have begun. So our hour of prayer on Tuesday, the young adult youth camp, uh, next weekend, the discipleship of Mike that he's doing with the ironworks. Now, the thing is, is he hasn't got, no one has been available to be an older mentor to a younger person. So he's changing it and adapting it to do peer mentoring. There's the children's Sunday school that's uh, in works. The curriculum is on its way. The teachers are uh, been found or committed. Uh, so that's still working through, hopefully for September. The plan to protect is still being worked through and slowly making advancement. We have the church council uh, in September on their on the fourth Wednesdays of the month. They're going to have their own growth uh, growth growth session and uh, learning and growing as leaders and pers persons themselves. We'll have something in October and November. I'm working on it and planning on it. Something called messy grace conversations. I'm not going to say anything more about that. Uh, you will hear about that later. Then you can go broader in our community. And so we got elections, federal and municipal. We got return of children back to school. Uh, we have uh, our own gospel witness. We must not forget to, that we are to be gospel witnesses. And we need to be praying for the unsaved that we know and asking God for opportunities and boldness to do so. We have had requests uh, for... Uh, prayer from Afghan pastors. Uh, I received a request from someone in uh, the United Arab Emirates who is friends with many pastors in Afghanistan, and you know what's going on in Afghanistan. So can you imagine being a Christian in Afghanistan with the Taliban taking over again and then being a pastor? Now that fits all in with the stuff we've been learning about First Peter and persecution, right? Uh, Haiti, you know, yes. We all forget about Haiti, right? Poor, that poor country has just suffered and suffered and suffered and suffered as well. And then we can continue to remember uh, Burma and the Koran and all the other ethnic groups and all the unrest that's going on over there and the oppression in Burma. So we have more than we can pray for this morning. So I'm only picking a few things, but these are all things that you can think about and pray and converse with God about during the week. Uh, if you ever have that thought, well, I don't know what to pray for. Okay, we've just given you 25 different things and people. And uh, God would respond to your conversations with him and change people's lives and assist them and change situations. So let us pray. Yahweh, maker and sustainer of all things that are created and that, that, that exist, you are the great God, the mighty God, the awesome one who alone is God. You show no favoritism. You show or you accept no bribes. You are pure. And there's no one like you. 
no God but you. May your name be praised. May your name be great forever. May your name's greatness start with us being praised among ourselves. We humble ourselves before you. We acknowledge that only through Jesus Christ, your son, do we approach you now. We do not come in our own power. We do not come with our own effort or our own merit or goodness. We come because Jesus has died and opened up a new and living way in which we have received the forgiveness of our sins, the reconciliation we needed with you, we who started a war with you. That has been forgiven. That has been removed. We're no longer your enemies. We are your children, and we are able through Jesus to come boldly into your presence, knowing we will not be harmed. We will not be judged. Your holiness and righteousness will not break out against us because our sin has been gone, taken away by Jesus our hearts, our lives, we've been given new birth. We're no longer hostile to you. We love you because you have loved us. And we come before you now humbly. You, the great God, we thank you and praise you that you have taken the time and the, had the desire and the will to reveal yourself to us. Your spirit, your invisible, non non-material and you are infinitely greater than us so there's no way we could know you there's no way we could find you we who are limited finite physical beings dependent upon our eyes and our ears to uh, to interact and see and hear things if you wanted to you could have remained hidden but you did not as our creator you revealed yourself through speaking, through the prophets and the apostles, and through the greatest way, your son Jesus Christ, through the incarnation, you became human. You took on flesh so that with our eyes, humans could see you. With our ears, we could hear you. With our hands, humans could put their hands in your hands. They could put their hands on your shoulders could touch you physically. So you, Jesus, are the greatest revelation of God. As the scriptures say, in you the fullness of deity dwells. Thank you for what we have learned and we praise you for your sovereignty, your knowing of all things, your having all power, your being all good and pure without evil. Your name is great. You are great. Father, your children, our brothers and our sisters are being attacked. They're being persecuted, exterminated in Afghanistan by the Taliban. And word has gotten out. Pastors who are actually in that country have gotten requests out to the wider church and they've asked us to pray. So this morning, Father, we ask you to provide physical protection and physical provision to our brothers and our sisters in Afghanistan. Nobody can get money out of the banks and the ATMs are empty. How can people buy food? How can they pay for transportation or gas or anything? They need provisions. But also they're hiding, they're going from house to house, room to room, hiding, changing their location every day. We ask that you would confuse those who search for them, confuse the minds of the Taliban. Let them become blind to the presence of Christians so that they just walk by them, they don't see them, and that their lives may be spared. They ask us to ask you, Father, to grant them an increase in faith. We know you are faithful that when you give us temptations and trials, you will also give the amount of grace and the amount of faith needed to overcome those temptations and to go through those trials. So we 
appeal to your faithfulness, your character that never changes, and say, Lord, give them the grace and the faithfulness that they need. Whether it's to endure this running and this hiding, whether it's to endure torture or captivity or even death, give them the faith that they will not turn from you at this time, that they will not love their life more than they love or they will than they love you. Let them love you above all things, even if it means the destruction of their body, the destruction of everything that they love else around them. Give them that faith, that love for you. May they love you with all their heart, all their soul, all their strength, all their mind, all that they have. But you have to supply that kind of strength and love and faith. And we pray that just as we learned last week, that you will let them know, as we learn from 1 Peter, that in the persecution, in the suffering for when they suffer for doing good, you are present with them, Father. You're present with them, Jesus. You're present with them, the Holy Spirit. That is such an encouragement. They need to know that. Open their eyes to that, Lord. So they may have strength. And also, we pray for these pastors because they ask us, to pray for opportunities to witness. What a great attitude that they have. Even in their fear, even in their time of persecution, they're looking to be ambassadors of you, Jesus, the King of Kings. They're looking and realizing that even those who chase them, it's their hearts have been darkened by Satan. Their minds have been blinded by Satan. And they're not really the enemy. It's the devil, and so they're looking to be used by you as instruments to fight the darkness and even those who chase them and in their Muslim neighbors and friends and co-workers and all that they know who may turn them over. Lord, may you use them to bring many Muslims to Christ. May you give them the wisdom to know that they may be as wise as serpents, innocents as doves knowing when to share the gospel and how to give testimony about you, Jesus. Bring them into contact with the Muslims whom you have been working in, confronting with yourself so that they may leave their Islamic faith and they may come to know the truth of Jesus Christ, that they may come to know their true creator and that he, they can have their sins forgiven completely, utterly, and have assurance of eternal life. Father, we want to pray for our youth and our young people as they go out next weekend. We thank you that they have this opportunity to go camping. We ask for physical safety, and the travel, no breakdowns of the car, safety from harsh weather, no wind events that would flatten tents, safety from animals, etc., But we ask that as they go, your spirit will be flowing among them and that they will have a unity growing in Jesus Christ and that they will build up their relationship and their trust amongst each other. They will see themselves as brothers and sisters in you and that the familial aspect of who we are in Christ will be strengthened and built up amongst them. And as this might be a good weekend for many of them to just go away and relax, we think of most of our, or almost all our worship team, music team is going. They need this break. They have been leading us in worship for a long time. And this is a chance for them to to go away. We ask for your special blessing on them, a rest and, and filling. And as Michael leads them, Help him as he does the final details. Enable Pastor Mike to not forget any little detail. Allow him to remember these things and to use him uh, to inspire and to guide those into the things that you have uh, that they you want him to guide your people, your children into to grow in their faith this weekend. And as they will next Sunday, be worshiping on a mountain, we will, we uh, ask that you will meet with them there. 
that you will make it special for them at that time. And Father, we want to pray for our children and our Sunday school. We thank you for all our children, but we pray for them because we know that they have been away from our gathering as the church for a long time because of COVID. It's difficult, disturbing, it's sad that they have not been able to gather for a year our children to hear your word taught. We hope and pray that the parents have been teaching them. But we have not been able to hear. And as we anticipate opening up our Sunday school for the children, we thank you that the curriculum is on its way. We ask that it will get here quick soon so teachers may have some time to prepare in advance. We thank you that we're able to open this up for them again. We love our children and we want to pray and ask that you will bless them. We want to pray for Kennedy, William Rock, Bethany, Arthur, Ava, Zoe, Eddie, Oliver, Diana, Caitlin, Kevin, Vincent, Jack, and others that I may not know or know of. We bring all these before you and ask that you would come upon them in the days and the weeks and the months to come and bring them to a personal saving relationship in faith in you. We want them to know you, Jesus, as Lord and Savior. That's the most important thing that can ever happen to them. And we ask that you would do this in the days to come and use us to reach our own children. Lord, you have heard all the other requests that were mentioned, ranging from natural disasters to personal brothers and sisters of ours suffering and dealing with tests and cancers to nations that are suffering. We leave them all in your great and capable hands. We thank you that you are so vast and so big and so great. All these very different requests are no problem for you to understand or to answer, or to deal with. We would be overwhelmed, but you were not. We thank you that this is who you are, and we can converse with you. Continue to speak with us during the week through your scriptures. And as we shortly go to your scripture this morning, open our ears to hear, allow my tongue to speak it clearly as it ought to be, and that we may hear from you this morning. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask Pastor Mike to come and read the scriptures for us this morning. The scripture reading today is on the slide. It is John 10, 11 to 16, and then 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4. John 10, 11 to 16. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks and the flock is scattered. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and the sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. 1 Peter 5, 1-4 To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of the God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, 
not lording it over others uh, entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. This is the word of the Lord for us. On June 13th of this year, Pastor Sanjay, along with his families and a few members of their church, were taken into police custody with the pretense that they had broken COVID-19 rules. But as the interrogation went on, it became very clear that their being taken into custody had nothing to do with breaking COVID rules. That was just a pretense to take them into custody. The question centered around the ministries of their church. The question centered around conversions to Christianity. And Pastor Sanjay was insulted. He was beaten with a belt. And he was accused that he moved into this village, the village of Shyampur, India, uh, 12 years ago, simply to try to lure people into converting to Christianity. Sanjay was threatened by these police. And they let the other members of the church go. But before Sanjay, the pastor, was allowed to go, one policeman said to him, you have to move out of this village. You no longer can stay in this village. Threatened and with no one willing to rent housing to them in the village, Pastor Sanjay's ministry at the Shyampur Church in India came to an abrupt end. He was forced out of his church and out of the village. And other Christians who were concerned for his safety and the family's safety helped them move to an undisclosed location a few hundred miles away. Previously, before that incident, this church in Shyampur had 150 members. And with that forced removal of Pastor Sanjay as the church by civil authorities, by the police, and with ongoing threats and, and pressure from the community on the church, people and members, the church has shrunk to 50 people. The attack on Pastor Sanjay, Sanjay illustrates why in 1 Peter chapter 5, as P- the apostle Peter addresses the church leaders called elders, This sudden speaking about elders is not unconnected to what he's been talking about. Because as Pastor Sanjay illustrates, sometimes when people are hostile to Christianity, they go after the church leaders first. And if they can get the leaders, we say in English, you cut off the head of the snake you can get the head of the snake, the rest of it becomes irrelevant. So they're going after the head, one of the leaders of the church. And they figure if they can get him, then the rest of the church members are far easier to deal with. But we also learned something last week from chapter 4, verses 12 and 17. There's another connecting link of what he's been saying in those verses that give rise to why it is appropriate Peter all of a sudden stop and talk to the elders or the church leaders. It's because in verse 12 and 17, we learned last week, God uses persecution, suffering for when we do what is right to test our faith. And also he uses it as a form of judgment that comes upon the church before he judges the whole world. Therefore, since God's judgment begins first with the church, as chapter 4, verse 17 says, it is appropriate then that he stopped, or not stop, but that he addresses the leaders of the church, the churches, all across these five provinces of of, uh, Asia Minor that he's uh, addressing. Because the leaders need to know how to care for the church in persecution, The leaders need to know how to lead the people in a godly manner to make it through the testing, to make it through the judgment in ways that they may be able to be found faithful to God and pass this test 
of persecution. So this is how this can connect. This, as you heard the scripture read this morning, you might not, you might think, well, Peter's just changing topics and everything. Well, no, it, it's connected. It's appropriate to talk to the leaders. Now, when Alexander Strauch, he was a, uh, he wrote a book on biblical eldership. When he was in seminary, he took a course on church polity and governance. And he asked his professor, he said to his professor, uh, what about the position of eldership in the church? And his professor said, I don't believe the church should be led by a group of men called elders. And so Alexander asked his professor, but he says, but look at all these verses in the New Testament that speak about elders. Don't they mean anything? And the professor replied, no, they don't mean anything. And my question to you is, is that as 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 4, addressing the elders was read this morning doesn't mean anything to you. Doesn't mean anything to you. Does your mind just go blank? Not because you've thought the issue carefully through and you've studied your church understanding and theology about the governance of a church and you disagree with elders being uh, the leaders of the church, but because simply you've never heard of elders in the church. Are you like me? I grew up in a Baptist church. I never heard of elders. I never heard of a group of elders leading or governing the church. That is not uncommon in many Baptist churches. You hear of deacons, and many Baptist churches will have deacons, and you hear about them in the New Testament, but what about elders? As one of our longest attending members, Ken Shields knows, as far as he knows, Zion Baptist Church has never had a group of elders. Prior to 2003, Ken Shield informed me that the governance of this church was a group of administrative leaders and deacons. That's what this church had. Then in 2003, those two groups were merged together into what we have today, our present church council. So for those of you who have joined after 2003 or you've come to know Christ in this church or grown up in this church after 2003, you don't even know what a church is that has deacons, let alone elders. You just understand this concept of a council. Our con current church constitution has no reference to either of the New Testament church leadership groups of elders or deacons. It only, our church constitution only references a council and ministry team leaders. The truth is, a proper understanding of elders and deacons and deaconesses and their qualifications, their roles, is actually a very helpful and healthy thing for us to have as a church. And it's critical to a healthy church, even for today, to have these two groups functioning in the church. But here's my dilemma. Here's my problem. So as I read this, when I was studying and we I were coming to this text, and I thought, okay, I need to preach this because we're going through 1 Peter. As I read the first verse, or as I read that, those few verses, I realized, okay, this is about how elders are to lead. This is what he's talking about. How are the elders to lead in their situation that they're facing? But this is my problem. The word elders. Many of you probably have no clue who they are or what they are. There's no point of talking about how they're to lead if you don't know what they are. So this morning, what I'm going to do is simply explain to you, I'm going to take, give you a crash course in what elders are and what they do. A summary of who they are and their functions. Then next week, we'll be able to actually look at the text and say, oh, this is how they do what they do. And you'll already know what they do. But you need to learn about how they're to do it. So what are elders? The short answer, they're under shepherds. Well, that doesn't often help a whole lot, does it? Under shepherds, well, that's kind of a metaphor. Uh, so let me explain. In the Bible, God uses sh the imagery of shepherds and sheep and the relationship between shepherds and sheep to describe 
the relationship between the rulers, the kings, the judges that God set to lead his people Israel. So the rulers, the kings, the judges, God calls shepherds. The people of Israel, or God's people, he called sheep. So this is how God illustrates or gives a picture of the leaders of Israel and of God's people, Israel. So for example, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 2, God said to King David, You will shepherd my people, Israel. You will become their ruler. So notice, ruler and shepherd are put in parallel. So yeah, David, you're going to be the king, but you're going to act like a shepherd. You're going to be the shepherd of my people. Later, David, after he sinfully counted all the men in Israel to see how many guys are fit for the military, David said this to God in 2 Samuel 24, 17. When David saw the angel who was striking down the people, he said to the Lord, I have sinned. I, the shepherd, have done wrong. These are but sheep, referring to the people who were bearing the punishment of David's sin. Now, the problem, if you've read through your Old Testament, even particularly some of the historical books that deal with the history of Israel and its kings, like 1 Kings and 2 Kings, and even as illustrated here with David, they often failed as kings and rulers. They were bad, many bad kings who did not care for the sheep, who didn't actually look after the God's people or the people that were under them. They didn't rule them well. They actually led them into sin, bringing about God's judgment upon them. They led them into idolatry. They led them into all kinds of things. They took advantage of the people and made themselves rich off the people or whatever way they abused the people. So eventually God said, that's enough. I'm not going to tolerate these bad shepherds, these bad kings and rulers and judges and bad priests and bad prophets and corrupt people ruling my people, hurting them and harming my flock, my sheep. So in Ezekiel chapter 34, God just lambays. He just lights into the shepherds of Israel and says, you are judged, you are done. And as he is uh, telling these shepherds of Israel and these kings, and he's saying, look, that's it for you. He pranks a promise. And he says what he's going to do. I'm going to set a new shepherd over my people. I'm going to set a shepherd, a son of David, a, re a king, who is going to shepherd my people the way they should be shepherd in justice and in righteousness and with perfection. That prophecy is fulfilled in Jesus. That's what Mike was reading from John chapter 10. Jesus was speaking. He was reading Jesus' declaration where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. He's the fulfillment of the prophecy that God said in, through Ezekiel hundreds of years earlier. So Jesus is the one true shepherd who is gathering God's people. Jesus is the one king, the one ruler of God's people, who's bringing them into one flock, one people of God. Scripture, the Bible, shows that humans in our rebellion against God, our shepherd, are lost sheep. We wander, we stray, we're harassed, we're facing death. That's what we are as lost sheep. Isaiah 53, 6 says, all like, all like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned away, every one of us, to his own way. In the parable of the lost sheep in Luke 15, sinners are lost sheep. But the good news is, as Jesus states in John 10, verse 11 and 15, is he's the promised shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He's seeking the lost sinners. He's seeking the lost sheep. And he laid down his life so that we may come back into relationship with God, we may have restoration with God through the forgiveness of sins and become part of God's flock or God's people. But the full experience of that promise where we are led by Christ himself and into this place of safety and complete perfection and joy, well, that's not yet. We haven't, we haven't got the new heaven and the new earth yet. We haven't got our new bodies and these things yet. 
We have to wait till his return. So Jesus, after his resurrection, gave instructions to the disciples, the apostles, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I command you. And so until Jesus returns, as we go and make disciples, we are proclaiming the gospel. More people, lost sheep are found through the gospel as they respond to it. They become the flock of God. And until Jesus returns, these, this flock, who, the people who are re responding to the gospel, becoming the people of God or the sheep of God, Jesus has appointed over them under shepherds, elders in the local churches. So this is the idea of an elder as an under shepherd. They are shepherds under the authority of Jesus who are looking after the flock until Jesus returns. So back to 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4, Peter clearly acknowledges in that text, he says, elders are shepherds. Shepherd the flock of God who is under your care. And the chief shepherd, okay, so it doesn't mean that the elders are not the boss. They're under Jesus. They are to lead the sheep in the way Jesus wants and lead them and care for them the way Jesus wants. They will give an account to the chief shepherd. And the apostle Paul also confirms that the Holy Spirit appointed men in the church at Ephesus who were elders, called elders at Ephesus. And he says, I gave you the task of shepherding. You can find that in Acts chapter 20. I'll just read that. Acts 20, verse 17 to 18 and 28. So from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, and then we'll skip down to verse 28 because he says a whole lot of things. Verse 28, he says, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock, that is the congregations at Ephesus, of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. So you can see now that, yes, in the New Testament, a very apt understanding of what an elder is, is they are an under-shepherd, under Jesus. So with that understanding that the New Testament applies the noun and the verb forms of shepherd and shepherding imagery to describe elders and their work, we can define elders this way. Here are two definitions. The first one's from by Jeremy Wrynn. Elders are under shepherds who serve the good shepherd by leading his sheep. Okay, very simple, very basic. Another one that is by uh, Alexander Strauch. A spirit-appointed body of qualified functioning shepherds who jointly pastor God's flock. Now, the important thing to note before I move on is this. As God or Jesus appoints shepherds or elders in each congregation, you have to understand when you trace through the New Testament, as the elders were put in the churches, as the churches were planted, as people responded to the evangelistic efforts of Paul, and churches, groups were established, they always established a body of elders, plural. Not an elder for each church, but a group of elders. Always a group, never just one. Always a group. And they were responsible for a, a few things. So what do elders do? Elders essentially do three things. This is the task of the shepherds of the church. The first is to feed the sheep, if you want to keep using the metaphor. Well, what does it mean to feed the sheep? It means to teach the people of God the word of God. As Paul lists the qualifications for an elder in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, actually, when you look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, there isn't a lot of skills that the elder is required to have. Most of it is character traits, godly character traits. But there are a couple skills. And in 1 Timothy 3 verse 2, the one skill that the elder needs to have is he needs to be able to teach the Bible, the word of God. And Titus chapter 1 verse 9 explains why the elder has to be able to have a skill and an ability to teach. 
So in this section of Titus chapter 1, it's talking about elders. And it says here in verse 9, He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. So the, the elder has to be able to build up the body of Christ, the people of God, with good, sound, solid teaching from the scripture. So that's why it's necessary they are able to teach. But not only do they build up the body, they also refute false teaching and heresy to help protect the sheep or deal with it when it comes up from the sheep itself and bring correction and rebuke as necessary. They have to be able to say, no, this is not scriptural. This is not right. So that the sheep do not end up eating poisonous food. They want, God, Jesus wants his sheep to eat healthy food, his scripture rightly interpreted. Now, this responsibility of feeding the flock is so great that some elders who are to work at teaching are to work at teaching more than the other elders and they get paid for it because it's such a heavy and an important duty. They said, well, we need some of these elders out of the group of them to devote their time full time to it. Well, if they're devoting their full time to it, they can't make a living, so we will pay them to do it. You find this in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 to 18. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain and the worker deserves his wages. Now this duty of feeding the sheep, teaching the sheep the word of God, is one thing that distinguishes the office of elders from deacons or deaconesses. Now let me just stop there for a second. Diaconate. Diaconate is the office of men and women of the other uh, office mentioned in the New Testament apart from, from elders. In English, we use a male and a female form for the people in there, deacon and deaconess. Instead of having to say deacon and deaconess all the time, we simply say diaconate, which is the word referring to that office. So the, my point here is this requirement for elders to be able to teach is not a requirement of people, men or women, who will be in the diaconate. They don't have that responsibility. What's the second thing that the elders do as shepherds? The first is they feed the sheep or teach the sheep. The second one is they lead the sheep, right? Or govern the sheep. I've already read to you 1 Timothy 5.17 that states the elders direct the affairs of the church. But this leading, governing aspect is found elsewhere as the Apostle Paul instructs Titus in Titus 1.5 that he is to go into every village on the island of Crete where they have, or Crete, where they have been uh, explaining the gospel and people have responded. He says, establish elders in every church. And as he is to do that in Titus 1.7, he describes this qualification. He says, the, an elder is an overseer that manages God's household. So again, they change the imagery from the flock to the household of God. We kind of have that imagery already from Peter in the first Peter. So elders and overseers are the same group, the same office in the New Testament. Elders oversee, they govern, they manage, they direct the affairs of God's people. Therefore, Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 2, he says, uh, elders are to uh, watch, it says watching over them. Again, that's translating that word oversee is what that word is. Oversee the sheep of God. Third thing that elders do. So they feed, they lead, and they tend. I think we'll say tend the sheep. 
which means to care for the sheep. Uh, James chapter 5, verse 14, speaks of the elders. If anyone is sick, call the elders to anoint them the sick one in oil. But we must remember what else goes in those same verses from James. It talks about the person who is sick or wanting anointing, confessing their sin. Elders deal with the spirit, not just the physically sick, but the spiritually sick amongst them. Those who are sinning, those who are straying, the sheep that are wandering off, the sheep that are rebellious. The elders need to deal with the spiritual unhealthiness in the, con in the flock as well. Not just the physical, but the spiritual sickness. Uh, they need to care and deal with those things. Paul states in Acts 20, verse 28 to 31, elders are to care through the sheep through guarding and protecting them from false teaching and false teachers. In Ezekiel 34, verse 4, God charged the shepherds he had put over Israel for not uh, caring for the injured sheep, not seeking the straying sheep, not looking for the lost sheep. So this all comes under this aspect of care and tendering, tending for the sheep. So in summary, that, that's what the elder does. Those are the three focuses of an elder. Feed or teach them the word of God. Lead or govern the people of God. Tend or care for them uh, with their spiritual health and their physical health. So, but why would they do that? What, what, what goal? Why would they feed, lead, and tend the sheep? What's the goal that's to be fulfilled there? What's the aim of all this shepherding? The aim of the shepherding is not for the shepherd's goal. It's for the goal of what Jesus has for the sheep. And we find the goal of what Jesus has for the church, for his flock, for his people in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 14. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 14. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Now, your first thought is probably, uh, Pastor Mark, that verse doesn't, those verses don't mention elders. So how can this be the goal of elders for their work? Actually, the verse does mention elders indirectly. I would say perhaps even directly if you want to use another name. The word pastor there, that is translated pastor in English, it is in Greek, poimen, or poimenos in plural. And that word that translates pastors here is actually used to describe Jesus as the shepherd. It's the same word used to describe shepherds who actually looked after sheep in ordinary Greek language. So I believe it's the ESV, the English Standard Version, actually translates it that way. So Christ gave to himself shepherds and teachers. So you might say, well, why didn't the NIV version, which I'm reading from, translate it shepherds? They did. And I only learned this a couple years ago. The word pastor in English is not English. It's not an originally English word. It's Latin. And what in Latin does pastor mean? It means shepherd. So it's translated shepherd using Latin. A Latin word has become an English word. And in the New Testament, who are the shepherds that look after the flock of God in the New Testament? Who are the shepherds? Who are the under shepherds? It's the elders. So this is what Jesus has given to the church. He has given elders to the church. So here, what is the goal 
that they shepherd for. The goal is that they equip you to do the work of God so that then we all may be built up, unified in the faith and the knowledge of Jesus and become mature like Jesus. This is why shepherds feed, lead, and teach. For this goal, to equip you to do the work of God and to bring you to unity in the faith and maturity in Christ and in knowledge of Jesus. One last thing before we kind of wrap up. All right, I've mentioned de- the diaconate or deacons and deaconesses and elders. Okay, how, how do they really differ other than that the diaconate doesn't have the qualification to teach? That isn't one of their key roles. Well, if you're to read 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus 1, you'll find the qualifications for the eldership and the diaconate, and you'll find some differences there. <clears throat> However, the real, some of the real uh, differences will come from Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, I believe, is not where deacons originate in the New Testament. If you read it carefully, that's not what that chapter in Acts 6 is about. Acts 6 is where the Jerusalem church is growing so fast and so quick, it's overwhelming the apostles. They don't have, they just can't handle the workload. So what's happening is that in this particular situation in Acts 6, is there is a food distribution to widows, Hebraic widows, widows who are of Hebrew descent, and Greek widows. And because this just the church is growing so fast, there's not enough people helping or whatever, the apostles can't handle it. And so some of the Greek widows aren't getting their food. It's not getting distributed properly. And there's starting to be some complaints. So the apostles say, look, in Acts chapter 6, it's not right for us to leave the focus of what we do as apostles, preaching, teaching the word of the God and the gospel and prayer to look after with the food of widows, the food distribution. So they proposed to the church in Jerusalem as apostles, you find seven men who are full of the Holy Spirit and we will turn that whole ministry over to them so that ministry as worthy and needing and, and as important as it is will get the proper attention and execution so that nobody is going to get missed. And the church says, yeah, that's a great idea. So they chose seven men and that's what happens. Now, that didn't create the diaconate, but it did set a precedent. It set a pattern that is good for elders and deacons later in the New Testament. And here's the pattern. The apostolic precedent or pattern was they focused on their task of teaching the word of God and prayer. And they appointed others to do the other tasks. So elders in the church, as the church grows, the elders should not divert from their three main tasks of feeding, leading, and caring. Teaching, governing, and caring. They should focus on that. And therefore, as the church grew, at some point, we don't know when, the New Testament doesn't tell us, they established officially the diaconate or deacons and deaconesses as assistants to the elders so that the deacons and deaconesses assisted the elders in all the other matters that needed to be done as the church grew so that the elders could still focus on their work. So in other words, uh, so at some point, the early church officially formalized the diaconate, as it is described in 1 Timothy 3 and referred to in Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. We just don't know when, but we do know it was formally recognized. So you have two official structures of leadership in the church in the New Testament. Elders, eldership, a group of men, and then a group of men and women called the diaconate or deacons and deaconesses. So in other words, the difference between them is that elders then focus on teaching a sound doctrine, the spiritual care and the spiritual health and direction of the church. The diaconate or the deacons and deaconesses, they execute the ministries of the church. They actually run the ministries. They actually 
uh, do the organization and the execution of the ministry and the committees and the teams, and they look after the physical needs of people and the possessions of the church, and they're the ones who engage people in society. All right? That's the difference between them. So there's a very, very brief introduction to elders. I don't have time to show you from the New Testament. That was the consistent pattern of leadership that was set up in the early church, body of elders. Everywhere people responded to the gospel and the church was formed, a group of elders was established. I don't have time to show you that. And then later, they were assisted by a diaconate. I'll have to do that another time. But if you have uh, never heard of elders, and this is all new to you today, this is far more than enough for you to chew on for now. Two concluding thoughts, then, for, to, for you to wrestle with. Here's the first thought. As I mentioned, many Baptist churches have never had elders. But they've had deacons. In all the churches I've worked in and grew up in, they've always had deacons, except this one, except Zion. They had a formal role, deacon board, or a diaconate. Did you know that if you search through the New Testament, the verse, the passages that describe the diaconate in the New Testament, you have one passage. That's uh, 1 Timothy 3, 18 to 13. And you have only two references to the diaconate in two other passages. The one was Philippians 1, 1, where I think it mentions Phoebe, a deacon or deaconess from Centrea. And then one other little passage. So three passages in the whole entire New Testament mention deacons. That's it. But when you search and go carefully through the New Testament, you will see that elders and eldership are mentioned in 10 passages and inferred in three others, such as Ephesians 4.11. So my point is, is you've got 13 passages relating to elders and three on deacons. Doesn't something strike you weird, funny? Wrong there? Why has the Baptist churches always had deacons, which is the lesser mentioned group in the New Testament, and all this scripture on elders is ignored? Something strikes me as odd there. Something's not right. Because we say as Baptists, we like to say we're people of the book. We like to say that this is the final authority, which is correct. It is the final authority for everything that we do. Why this ignorance in Baptist churches on elders? When it has more teaching, yet we have a lot more stuff on, practically we're doing the deacon stuff. In history, prior in the 1800s, okay, Baptists only come into existence in the 1600s in England. In the 1800s and prior to that, Baptist churches had elders in North America. Sometime in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, 100 years ago, elders disappeared from the North American Baptist churches, from a bunch of them. Why? It doesn't make any sense. So if any of you are going to do a church history degree, there's a great topic for a thesis. Find out why. That's the first thing I want you to, to, to leave with you is, why? Because elders, they have more passages than deacons do, but we don't have elders in a lot of Baptist churches. There's something wrong there. The last thing that I want to leave with you, the second and last thing, is this. So as I mentioned, Scripture's our final authority, right? It tells us who God is. It tells us who we are, how to know God. It tells us how to organize, organize ourselves as a church. It defines who we are as the church, as God's people, as God's sheep, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. So it is the final authority then for how we organize ourselves, including our leadership. So I would like to suggest that we prayerfully go on a journey. Remember, get that word, journey. This isn't something you do quick. This is something we need to explore together. I would suggest that we need to prayerfully learn what elders are, what they do, what their qualifications are, what are required of them. And eventually, I would suggest, transition our council into a board of elders or a council of elders. 
and then prayerfully continue to learn and discern on a journey. What are deacons and deaconesses? What do they do? What's their qualifications? And serve and how they serve and then transition our ministry teams and their leaders and our administrative leaders into a board or a group of de a diaconate. And you might, and then here's the benefits of this. To align our church structure of governing with the scripture of the New Testament, here's some of the benefits. Number one, we're all going to know what the job descriptions are. Because when we start getting away from these two foundational things and we start calling our leaders different things, job descriptions get fuzzy. I've been in a church where you had superintendents of different areas in the church. Well, really, what's a superintendent? Uh, council, you could really throw in a bunch of worldly ideas of what a council does from business or other things. When you want to start calling certain people in the church the CEO or you start using those kinds of languages and positions, the job descriptions get fuzzy. You don't know, what do I do? I've had people join a church council or a deacon board and they go, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. But if we have these titles and these councils, then we simply look at the scripture and there's your job description. And also it helps us uh, divide the work. So right now, on a practical level, our church council, when you look at the constitution and their job description, they have combined the work of the elders with the work of deacons. You have just killed your council because nobody can do that double load of work. You can't do it. It's too much. That's why there's two separate types of leaders in the church. To protect you from being overworked. And to protect, as, we, as you learn from Acts 6, other things taking you away from the priority of the things that you should be doing and focusing on. So the apostle says, no, we have to focus on teaching and prayer. Right now, sometimes your church council, speaking very frankly, okay, how much time have they had to deal with our proposed renovations? If the council is equivalent to elders, they shouldn't have to deal with anything with renovations other than thinking through, okay, spiritually, how will this affect the ministry of the church? And is that a healthy or an unhealthy thing for the church? And then all the stuff about it should be given over to a group of people who are qualified and able to deal with that and run with it. And the council can keep focusing on their other focuses. So you see how you blend and you put everything in. I've been in a couple churches where that's happened. They just have a deacon board and they end up doing everything from administration to everything. And things get left out. Things don't get done well. People get burnt out. This is the benefits of this. God's smart. I mean, God's wise. We need to submit to this wisdom. And lastly, you get clear biblical qualifications for the leaders. You might think, oh, well, am I qualified? Who's qualified? You've you got to vote them in. If you want to know the qualifications. Just because somebody sits on a board of a bank or they're a president of their own lumber company or whatever, that does not mean they're qualified to sit on a church leadership group. Just because someone teaches in a public school does not mean they're qualified to teach Sunday school or teach the Word of God in the, script, in, in the church. Teaching in the public school is very different from teaching the Word of God. You just can't assume because there's, so, there's par like parallel examples of leadership out in the secular world that, oh, that qualifies them to come in. Not at all. So then we will know what the qualifications are because they're listed here under elders and under deacons. There's a lot of health and a lot of good things that come from following the wisdom of how God organized his early church with this kind of leadership. Enough said. Baby steps, not giant steps. May Jesus, our shepherd, guide us forward. If this is correct and I've explained this correctly, then may God continue to put that seed in you and water it and grow it so that as a congregation, you hunger for this type of change and development. It's not something I want to push uh, real quick or fast, but I do want to take you on an exploration journey on that for sure. 
So there you go. Now back to First Peter, just to, just to say, okay, we've dealt with that issue, that dilemma. What's elders? Well, now you know. So next week we can actually look at the verses to see how the elders are supposed to lead. And we'll leave it at that. May the uh, team come and lead us. Before we go, we have a few announcements. Uh, we are continuing the baptism classes with uh, Pastor, or they're finished. Yes, so they just finished yesterday, and so they have completed that. If you have missed out and you wanted to take part, and maybe you're thinking, you know, maybe I should have taken part, uh, please talk to Pastor Mark. We are continuing to have uh, live streaming and in-person services. So for those of you online, uh, we thank you for joining us online. And for those in person, thank you for being here in person. Uh, we want to make sure to accommodate everyone where they are at, whether they're able to leave home or not. And so we will be continuing to do online services on YouTube as well as in-person services. As Mark had mentioned about equipping the church council members, we are doing a growth session prep, so please pick up uh, the book from Pastor Mark by September 5th. We will be going through that as a way to increase our knowledge and grow as council members. The church directory is having the final changes added and being updated, so hopefully a copy will be available by next week. If you're like, oh no, I forgot to mention this, contact Klondike today or let us know today so that we can make sure that that's in before it's printed. Uh, because once it's printed, that's a lot of paper to go and we're trying to be green, so let us know by today.
The regular services or regular ministries will be continuing with youth on Monday uh, at seven o'clock. That's tomorrow. And then next week we will be having a youth camp out uh, for youth and young adults during the weekend. And that next Monday, right after the camp out, we won't be having youth group because they've had enough of me. They need a break. Uh, <laughs> so tomorrow we will have youth group and then next week on Monday, it will be uh, canceled. We are doing an hour of prayer every Tuesday at 7 p.m. And that is currently online. However, in September, we are looking at the option of moving in person. So please talk to Pastor Mark if you have questions about that or if you'd like to take part. And we would love to move it in person to be able to connect with each other a little bit better than we can online. For those of you that have been watching the news, you know that there is very likely coming a federal election coming up and there are concerns that you may have and we want to pray for that if you would like resources about okay how do we go about an election from a christian perspective the denomination has put out resources and while we want to stay relatively unpartisan not supporting one or the other there are principles that we can follow while we engage with this lovingly and respectfully and wisely so those are on the back counter they were sent out in the email with the announcements but if you have not received that you can let us know and we can connect you with that our community covered has uh, had a number of people that it has served so please make sure to check it and if you have even one or two cans of extra food or an extra itchy band container if you're a college student then you can drop that off on Sundays or throughout the week, and we would love to share it with our community. You can also drop off any books that you're done with or pick up a book that you want to read. And it's sort of take some food, leave some food, take a book, leave a book. And then as Mark mentioned, we are moving the discipleship program to a pure discipleship. I'm going to be calling it Brazing Hearts, because I like puns and it's like Blazing Hearts, but anyway. Uh, brazing is when two medals are joined together with a bonding medal. And I want to encourage people to bind our hearts with the binding of Christ's love and his scriptures. So if you are interested in that, we will be focusing on youth and young adults first. However, if you are not a youth or young adult and you are interested saying, you know, I don't know what this discipleship thing is. Maybe... I'm 80 and I've never seen discipleship. Talk to me. We might be able to figure something out. So please let me know. I've sent out a few emails. I uh, don't have the emails because my, uh, of a couple people because my uh, Outlook account somehow lead them so I had to redo them. So I will be trying to contact people with that information and if you would like to talk to me, please do. I invite Pastor Mark up to do the benediction. This comes from the book of Hebrews. Uh, please rise. Now may God, now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.